From the nation's capital, the Conservative Caucus presents Conservative Roundtable, an in-depth look at today's most important issues. Welcome to Conservative Roundtable. I'm Howard Phillips, chairman of the Conservative Caucus, which sponsors these broadcasts now being viewed in more than 100 communities all over America. Our guest for this broadcast is my friend Rob Shank, head of the National Clergy Council, who has been in the news recently because of his work in support of the Ten Commandments. Rob, for starters, what is the National Clergy Council? The National Clergy Council is a network of church leaders from Catholic, Evangelical, Orthodox, all Protestant traditions, who join together to bring classical Christian moral instruction into the conversation and debate surrounding public policy. So I, I shortcut that by saying we bother the consciences of our elected officials. What are some of the issues in which you've been involved over the years? Three key issues, sanctity of human life, conception to natural death, sanctity of marriage and the family, and the public acknowledgement of God. Those are our three key uh, areas that we focus on. And because of your stands on those issues, uh, you have been a strong supporter of uh, former Alabama Supreme Court Chief Justice Roy Moore, as have I, and he's a personal friend to each of us. I know you were as disappointed as I that uh, he was unsuccessful in his campaign for governor of Alabama. I was indeed. What do you think uh, Judge Moore should do now? Well, I think he's been a very effective voice in the country. I think he's, he has made an impact on a lot of people, a lot of important people. He is virtually retraining a generation of lawyers that have been schooled in gross error uh, in the law, in their uh, lack of understanding of the Constitution. In fact, most lawyers haven't even read the Constitution. And with his Center for Moral, uh, his uh, Foundation for Moral Law headquartered in Montgomery, he's doing an excellent job, I think, bringing back the right, uh, really correcting those <laughs> errors, those historical errors in, in, in uh, legal education. So I think he'll continue to be a great voice for the nation. And uh, in one way, had he become governor, he would have belonged to Alabama. Now he, he belongs to the country, and that's very good for us. Well, and I think he intends to provide leadership for the country. I've chatted with him on a couple of occasions since uh, the primary, and uh, he's come to my view of uh, the Republican Party as being more of an adversary than an ally to the things we believe in, and he's indicated his uh, need, his feeling that uh, he needs to provide leadership to Christian conservatives around the country who've been betrayed and unsuccessful in their present approach to uh, political involvement. Uh, and uh, we've worked with him, of course, on the Constitution Restoration Act, mm -hmm. which continues to gain sponsorship in the uh, U.S. Senate and House of Representatives behind the leadership of folks like Senator Dick Shelby of Alabama mm -hmm. and uh, others. And uh, I pray that uh, God has only begun to Absolutely. use Roy Moore in a big way. Now, he was uh, kicked out of uh, the position of Chief Justice because as uh, Chief Justice, he was in charge of the rotunda of the Alabama Judicial Building, and at his own private expense, he had built and he installed a monument to the Ten Commandments, and he refused to move it when a federal judge improperly, unconstitutionally, arrogantly uh, said that because it gave offense to uh, some lawyers who had to walk past it on the way to court, uh, that he had to get rid of it, and of course he said the, the judge had no right to do that. It was none of his business, and uh, sadly, some cowardly politicians in Alabama, led by Governor Riley, and then uh, Attorney General, uh, whatever his name is, who's now a federal judge, yeah. uh, protege of Carl Rove, Pryor. yeah, Bill Pryor, mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, they kicked him out of office, but he was willing to surrender his position, his pension, his paycheck, to stand for what he believed was right. Now, you're uh, in a somewhat analogous position now because you have installed uh, a Ten Commandments monument on Capitol Hill uh, without having secured the permission of either the Capitol Police or Nancy Pelosi or <laughs> Dennis Hastert or uh, the mayor of Washington, D.C. or George Bush. You just went ahead and did it. Give us some of the background. 
Well, I will. In fact, uh, of course, uh, our mutual friend, uh, former Chief Justice Roy Moore, uh, Judge Moore as I call him, uh, was an inspiration uh, to us in this. But even more so, the people of Adams County, Ohio, where four beautiful sculptures of the Ten Commandments were placed in front of four public schools back in the uh, uh, middle 90s. And uh, the ACLU came in, sued the Adams County School District. Now, this is one of the poorest ACLU, counties. ACLU, that's the anti-Christian liberty union. That would be that. Okay. And uh, whatever they stand for, uh, they came into one of the poorest counties in the state of Ohio, sits right on the Kentucky border, and sued the school district to have those Ten Commandments removed. They not only got them removed, but they also got a settlement of $70,000. They picked the pockets of school children, poor school children, in Adams County, Ohio, simply to make a point. Well, one of those monuments... And to make a profit. And to make a profit. Uh, in fact, I pulled their their uh, financials that year to look at them, and uh, they had $327 million in a contingency fund that was simply accruing interest, and they were telling the court they needed $70,000 to pay their legal fees. Absolutely outrageous. And the, and the federal courts were happy to be their collection agent. But in any case, one of those beautiful sculptures was given to us in our headquarters for both the National Clergy Council and its lay affiliate, Faith and Action, sits immediately across the street from the United States Supreme Court in full visibility of all of the justices as well as the senators and members of the House of Representatives. And we had looked at our front yard for a long time. Five years ago, I attempted to get a permit for this sculpture to be permanently installed. I was told it would take three hours for that permit to be issued. Nine months later, I was still running circles around bureaucracies. Nobody wanted to touch it. Finally, we put the monument temporarily in our back garden, what we call our prayer garden, invisible to the street. And then finally decided it was time to simply do what we have the constitutional right to do, just as anybody else does on Capitol Hill, and that is put a sculpture in our own front garden, and we did it on Memorial Day, and it sits there. And since that time, this, the liberal uh, left-wing District of Columbia government has been going apoplectic ever since. Well, it's your garden. It's your property. What business is it of theirs? Well, here's the curious thing in our nation's capital. Front yards or gardens are considered public space and are under the control of the government of the District of Columbia. In fact, they told me, Reverend, if we don't like your Christmas tree and it's in your bay window, your bay window extends out over your front yard. That's our domain. We'll come in and take your Christmas tree out. I said, go ahead and make my day. I'd, I'd love that day to come. And, of course, you said that uh, it's all under the control of the D.C. government. But as I read the Constitution, the D.C. government is all under the control of the Congress of the United States. That would be true. That would be true. And I'd like to think that the Congress right now had the spine to stand up against this kind of tyranny, but they don't, so they can get away with it. And what they've told us is, unless you get a permit from us, which they have no intention of ever issuing, we tried five years ago, and five years later we still don't have a permit, but unless we go through it, they will fine us $300 a day, starting uh, in the month of July, we will be fined uh, $300 a day, so that begins now, and uh, possible seizure of our property. If we fail to pay the fines, they have the right under law well, to surely, seize our property. Uh, people would rise up in outrage if this were to be done by the D.C. government. I would hope and pray they would because every other person that, has, that owns property on Capitol Hill is permitted to put whatever they want in their garden. We have full-size nude statues, <laughs> modern art, we have urns, pottery, we have huge bird baths, but you cannot have a monument of the Ten now, Commandments. If an organization such as the Conservative Caucus wanted to rally support for you, uh, is there a written statement recounting what you just told us? Yes, uh, you can get uh, the information on our website, or we will certainly provide all the material that you need, including the letter from the District of Columbia government that is, to read it, is, yeah. is unbelievable. If you could send us a copy, I'd like to do something with it. You know, they say that, uh, and you know this uh, better than I do, you've been around here longer than I have, but they can't fill potholes in two years. We were served papers in three days. 
that's that's a miracle in the District of Columbia. They're pretty good at uh, parking meters too. I guess so. So, how is your organization supported? We have individuals, churches, uh, and what we call uh, major donors. I mean, people who invest significant amounts of money in what we do all across the country. Uh, we have uh, 5,000 clergy members, 20,000 lay associate members, and they are the people who, uh, who help us pay the bills and uh, keep the doors open and have allowed us to be right on Capitol Hill where we can do a lot of uh, damage. Rob, we have to take a break now. When we come back, I want to uh, get your views on the key issues from a moral perspective facing the Congress, facing the country, and uh, I want to get your take on the recent debate about the homosexual marriage amendment, the context of the, um, the language of the amendment and the way in which it was dealt with in the U.S. Senate. Please stay with us. Our guest is the Reverend Rob Shank of the National Clergy Council. We'll be right back. One of the major activities of the Conservative Caucus is constitution education. We want to help raise up a new generation of leaders who understand the underlying principles of the Constitution and the meaning of its key provisions. Through programs such as Conservative Roundtable, uh, through mailings, workshops, conferences, seminars, uh, we strive to communicate the legacy of the Founding Fathers. Each year we commemorate Constitution Day, September 17th. We publish newsletters, action bulletins, and uh, other materials to promote an understanding of and fidelity to the Constitution, and we work with members of Congress who share our vision and share our concern. We hope you will decide to work with us as well by becoming a supporter of the Conservative Caucus. www.conservativeusa.org, 703-938-9626. Face the Truth is a production of the Conservative Caucus and is seen twice monthly on the station you are watching. We will be interviewing the movers and shakers of the pro-life movement. We hope to educate and even inspire you about what is being done in our country to protect and to promote the sanctity of life. Please watch us. Don't miss Face the Truth with Stephen Peruca and Conservative Roundtable with Howard Phillips right here on this station every week. Here's how you can become a citizen lobbyist and influence how your representatives vote. Write a letter to your congressmen and senators. Speak out on a call-in talk radio program. Write a letter to the editor of your local newspaper and call the Conservative Caucus for more information at 703-938-9626. Welcome back. I'm here with Reverend Rob Schenk of the National Clergy Council, and uh, we've heard about uh, his efforts to display the Ten Commandments in a manner visible to uh, the lawyers, lobbyists, and politicians who wander around Capitol Hill, and even some of the judges at the Supreme Court, which is across the street from uh, Rob's office. Rob, let's talk about some of the issues uh, which are on the political front burner. What, uh, what do you think of the, the language of the homosexual marriage amendment? Did it satisfy your concerns? And, and why do you think it didn't do better? Well, sad to say that I think the reason it didn't, if I may go to the second question first, that the reason it didn't do better is uh, probably a myriad of reasons, but one among them is we lack for moral courage in uh, the Senate, and we, we probably do better in the House, but we don't have enough moral courage in the House, and that is our problem in the United States, period. When it comes to all the critical moral issues, the problem is the Congress has all the power it needs under the Constitution yep. to correct all of these problems. You know, the Defense of Marriage Act could solve this problem without a constitutional yes, amendment. Yes, most certainly could, and, and, and as we should, I, I get squeamish when we talk about amendments to the Constitution. I'm with you. And I, you know, so I never, I've never been terribly enthusiastic. If we have to have one, it's got to be done in the proper way. I wanted just a very simple amendment yep. that was clear, succinct to the point, and in as few words as possible. Marriage shall be between one man and one woman. 
you, you know, know, all you need is a majority uh, to uh, enforce the Defense of Marriage Act against the judges. Absolutely. And the states, whereas for a constitutional amendment, you need two thirds of both houses and three fourths of the states. Exactly. It's very high. I've had this argument. It should be. I've argued this question with uh, Richard Land and others pushing the uh, amendment, and uh, I don't think they get it. Uh, they think that for political reasons, it's wiser to go with the amendment. I don't buy it, it as witness the fact that, that we didn't do very well on it this time. Well, I agree with you completely. And, uh, and again, I think that people, you know, Americans are a whole lot smarter than Capitol Hill ever gives yep. credit for. And they can detect uh, political uh, machinations when they see, it, when they see them. We, we can taste it in the yep. air. And, you know, if they're really concerned about uh, the advance of the homosexual agenda, why do they keep authorizing subsidies to groups like gay men's health crisis? They call it AIDS education, but it's really a safe sodomy scheme, which underwrites sure. the infrastructure of the homosexual left uh, and right. That's right. And and people ask me all the time, and they ask you this, uh, Howard, and, and uh, we get asked all the time, well, how are we going to fix this? The way we're going to fix it is by, first of all, electing people who have an understanding of the Constitution the way this country really works, and secondly, who have moral right. courage. If we had a president who was truly against uh, the rise of the homosexual activists and, and wanted to thwart their efforts, he could stop it with a veto. Hmm. And, uh, but instead, we have a president who supports it in a whole variety of ways. He's been advancing the homosexual agenda. And, uh, whether it's by sending a homosexual ambassador to Romania, whether it's by funding homosexual activist groups, uh, whether it's waiving requirements against admitting uh, homosexual uh, aliens into the United States, uh, we, which he waived. Not even Bill Clinton waived it when he was president. Yeah. So we, we need a president who will take a stand against it. We need members of the House and Senate who have the courage to take a stand. And, of course, it goes without saying yeah. that they both... That is, a morally courageous president, morally courageous Congress needs to choose judges and justices who understand the restrictions that are placed on them and their limited role, very limited role in government. Rob, it may be old news by the time this show is broadcast, but frankly, I was shocked to see the governor of Maryland, Bob Ehrlich, pander to uh, these corrupt, perverse homosexual activists when he removed from uh, the Metropolitan Transit Board, or whatever it was, a very fine man who merely said that uh, homosexual conduct is a perversion. And within two hours, the governor of Maryland fired this guy who spoke the truth. But Bob Ehrlich uh, proved himself to be a complete political coward who succumbed to pressures from people engaged in sodomy, faggotry, bestiality, all kinds of perversions. I'm not sure of bestiality, but all of the others. Uh, I, I'm, I'm afraid that, uh, that, that uh, you know, that this, this, this is across the board. And, uh, in fact, Robert Smith, the man you're speaking about who was removed, actually used very precise language. He said that it was deviant behavior. Very well, good. Thank you for pointing that out. Homosexual activity deviates from the natural is, and the normative. You're right. That's he, a true statement. He didn't even call it perverse. No, he, he was he, punished for making a true yeah, statement. He didn't call them buggerers. He didn't call them faggots, That's right. uh, sodomites. He just said they were it, engaged it in deviant, deviant behavior. behavior. And it, it's a statement. of It's as factual as you can get. And yet he was politically punished, as you would be yeah. in the former Soviet Union or the People's yeah. Republic of China, yeah. Castro's Cuba. Well, whatever respect I had for Governor Ehrlich before is totally gone. What a despicable, cowardly act on his part. I'm afraid uh, we see a lot of it in this country, and that's why I challenge people. Look, when people are running for office, test their moral courage more than anything else, and look for a track record, because... You know, Jesus Christ said, you know a man by his fruits, by, by what already grows out of his life, not what he says he's going to plant, but what's already growing there. So take a look at the track record. Don't, don't look at the words. Look at the track record. Yep, absolutely. And, of course, uh, as Senator Tom Coburn, a very courageous member of the U.S. Senate from Oklahoma, has pointed out, 
the federal government is now funding about 30,000 private organizations with $300 billion a year in federal grants and contracts. That's why one of the reasons why the Conservative Caucus, working with Ron Paul of Texas, Scott Garrett of New Jersey, is promoting legislation which would give governors the authority to veto federal grants and contracts coming into their states uh, promoting organizations or activities or policies with which they disagree. This is a very important piece of legislation. And to prove that uh, a broken clock is right twice a day, Barack Obama and John McCain, two men with whom I am in comprehensive disagreement on just about everything, have introduced legislation which would require publication of data concerning all of the federal grants and contracts being issued by the federal government. You know, the Freedom of Information Act does not cover this. When I was director of the U.S. Office of Economic Opportunity, I tried to get this kind of information out. And I had my employees review all of the grant proposal, who's on the board, what does the article and bylaws say, um, what publications do they issue, in which causes do they involve, what kind of... Uh, Lobbying do they do, so-called law reform? What do they mean by community education? What kind of other groups are they organizing? Members of Congress have no idea what's going into their districts and their states. And as a result, uh, these unelected bureaucrats are uh, changing the culture, changing the country by assigning literally billions of dollars to their ideological allies. It is a disgrace. Absolutely, and there's a pathological blame-shifting that goes on. And most of it is the convenience of the courts uh, because what we have is we have elected officials who are saying, you know, I'd love to do the right thing. I'd love to do that. But you know what? The courts will shoot it right down. And they love that, that excuse uh, to get away with their irresponsibility and their cowardice by blame shifting to the courts. And it's, that's why all of the legislation having to do with the reform of the courts <coughs> and the uh, the limitation of the federal courts is so critical. So I would put that right at the top of the list. Well, in terms of the things that need to be changed in America, one is the government schools, uh, which are left-wing humanist indoctrination academies. Uh, the media, the, uh, the movies out of Hollywood, uh, the uh, cable television programs, network programs, and much more. The whole culture... Uh, and points of power in the culture are operating against the Christian values and principles and beliefs on which America was, in fact, founded, no matter what our adversaries say. And we only have 10 seconds now, so I'm not going to ask you to answer. But when we come back after this break, I'd like you to address that question. How do we deal with this comprehensive assault on Christian culture in the United States? We'll be right back with Rob Shank of the National Emergency Council. Peace to When you see the terrible decline in public morality, do you have a suspicion that something's gone wrong in America? Would you like to make a positive difference for freedom and for liberty? Institute on the Constitution is a historical study designed to teach you about the basic core ideas behind the Constitution. The ideas that built America. Call the number on the screen and learn more. The Institute on the Constitution, 410-768-2280, www.instituteontheconstitution.com. There are many conservative organizations, but the Conservative Caucus is unique in that our standard for evaluating public policy is the Constitution of the United States. Our goal is to advocate policies which conform to what the Constitution stipulates and to oppose those which undermine the Constitution. It's clear that the federal government has only those powers which are provided in the Constitution, which were initially delegated by the states to the federal government or which were subsequently added by amendment. If we adhered to that principle, your taxes would be lower and your liberties would be more secure. The Conservative Caucus, www.conservativeusa.org or 703-938-9626.
We're back. I'm glad you are, too. If you're interested in the kinds of issues we discuss on Conservative Roundtable, uh, please check out the website of the Conservative Caucus, www.conservativeusa.org. If you have questions or comments, fax them to us at uh, 703-281-4108 or drop me a note, Howard Phillips, at TCC, the Conservative Caucus, 450 Maple Avenue East, Vienna, Virginia, 22180. Rob Shank, you're doing good work with the Clergy Council. Thank you, sir. We've got about a minute and a half left. Tell us what we need to know. Wow. Well, one thing you need to know is that it's time to bury the National Council of Churches, the other NCC, and that's really one of our missions. Good. Is to bring out conservative clergy in every tradition of the Christian church to join together and to bring moral sanity to our civilization and do that through the pulpit, through the pen, our voices, our spheres of influence. And it's time that we bury this, uh, this leftist monster called the National Council of Churches that has been wreaking havoc uh, and uh, pretending to represent the Church of Christ for decades now. It's time to just uh, put up a headstone for them. So, Are you affiliated with uh, any of the Christian entities in the country? Well, only, uh, only by the membership that we have. Uh, we don't have formal affiliation. We're independent, and uh, we <coughs> rally around the uh, traditional interpretation, the Apostles' Creed, which brings in many different Christian traditions. So if you're a conservative Presbyterian, you'll be as happy as a Baptist, and uh, if you're a traditional Catholic with a conservative uh, theological and worldview, you'll be just as happy with us as a good conservative Methodist will be. So... Uh, we band together. We have a denomination represented for literally every letter of the alphabet. So a good thing is happening. We need more members. <coughs> well, Rob, I'm grateful that you took the time. It's been a Thank pleasure you, chatting sir. with you. Thank you. Stay with us for the next edition of Conservative Roundtable. See you later.